This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 41, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, and I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Let us hear the word of God. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down the princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the way the rich with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful, for he made the promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Well, earlier this week, Alan and I were winding up our day, having the, how was your day, dear, conversation. And well, honestly, I had had a crazy day. Anyone else here have a crazy kind of day this week? Anyone? A few people. I was wondering if you were going to raise your hand, Mary. I suspected that you all would understand the kind of day I am talking about. It was a day when the demands of motherhood and deadlines, children's birthdays and Advent all collided with some pretty unrealistic expectations. My day was ending surrounded by piles of laundry that seemed to be growing three sizes each day of the week, and a sink full of dishes, not even going to go there, and a to-do list that had grown three sizes as well. I was cranky and frustrated, and one might even say I was having a moment, a grinchy moment to be precise. And in my grinchy moment, Alan looked at me as he so often does and tried to shed a different perspective on it. He said, do you know in the technology industry, they have a practice known as MVP. Today you had an MVP kind of day. I gave him a look. You know, that look that goes with one of those moments. And I was thinking, now is really not the time for some silly sports analogy. MVP, most valuable player, I said, rolling my eyes. Nope, not most valuable player, Alan said, going on to explain. In the technology industry, MVP is the minimum viable product. It is the minimum standard a product needs to meet, so it just has enough core features to effectively deploy the product to customers. No more, no less. It is the standard used by businesses just to get the product out there, you know, to meet a deadline, to check it off the list, and oh, of course, to be able to tell your boss and your stakeholders 
that you've launched that product. Seriously, I responded in dismay. If this is a pep talk, it isn't working. <sighs> yep, Alan went on. Ultimately, the companies work out the bugs through feedback loops, updates, and the next version. Comforting, right? Not so much, but it does help us better understand why our phone never works the way we think it should and why we have so many technology challenges. So after I got over my initial irritation, I thought about the irony of using these letters that we typically associate with excellence, actually being used to describe situations that just meet the bare minimum, the lowest of low standards. I realized that this idea of MVP and MVP can actually be applied not only to our life, but to our worship series on the Grinch. This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke's Gospel gives us one of the most detailed accounts of the Christmas story, writing in such detail that you can clearly imagine what was taking place that very first Christmas. The writer of Luke's gospel starts at the, the very beginning of Jesus's human life with Mary's pregnancy and then intertwines the parallel both birth stories of Jesus and his cousin, John the Baptist. The writer of Luke's gospel is the only author who includes both of these stories. And you may be familiar with the stories of their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth. You see, both were unlikely candidates for pregnancy. Despite being married for many years, Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, were without a child and are in the season in life when pregnancy is all but impossible. And then on the other hand, you have Mary, at the beginning of her childbearing years. She is unmarried and remains a virgin, also a situation that made pregnancy impossible. Both pregnancies are announced by the angel Gabriel, and ultimately, both Mary and Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, respond to the news of the impending births in the spirit of worship, singing songs of thanksgiving and praise. Mary's response is known as Mary's song or the Magnificat. Magnificat is the Latin phrase that translates as my soul magnifies the Lord. And it is the scripture text that I read a few minutes ago. Mary's words in the Magnificat are powerful and prophetic as she magnifies the heart of God for us. And much has been written over the years about the Magnificat. In particular, its focus on justice and the reordering of society around the priorities of God. So as part of your Advent journey, I encourage you to, to spend some time this week reading and reflecting on these words. But sometimes I think that we have focused so much so much on the words that Mary is saying that we miss out on something that is equally important. We miss out on the how. How Mary at such a young age and in the dangerous situation of being pregnant and unmarried in a time in history when this was not socially or legally permissible. How? 
How was Mary able to respond to Elizabeth's greeting with a song that glorified God, glorified God through thanksgiving and praise? How? How was Mary able to speak prophetically in this moment? Last week, Pastor Brittany talked about how God makes the impossible possible. How we wouldn't have Christmas as we know it today if Mary had not embraced her faith, embraced her faith and and yielded to God's will for her life. You see, in Mary's faith and trust in the Lord, we see the how. We see how God makes the impossible possible. We see how Mary not only said yes to carrying God's son, but that Mary also chose to worship God joyfully in that challenging and confusing moment as well. Trusting that God's how makes the impossible possible. So as we reflect on Mary's response, the question for us also becomes, how? How do we respond to impossible situations with a life of worship and a spirit of faith and gratitude for the work that that God is doing in our hearts and in our midst? How? Well, it's by living a life of worship. Now, life of worship means to give God the glory, to give God the glory in all times and places, the good times and the challenging times through thanksgiving and praise. A life of worship is approaching each impossible situation we face. And approaching those situations in awe, in wonder, In anticipation, asking ourselves and God, what are you going to do next? But we know, just like those crazy challenging days, that this is so much easier said than done, isn't it? But Mary lived a life of worship with her eyes and her heart wide open to God. And in being open to God, Mary was able to see how God was moving mightily in her life and in the world around her. We see this in in Mary's actions and in her words the words of Mary's song. In these words, Mary is clear and confident that God is breaking into the world and that nothing, not one single thing in all of the history of creation will ever be the same. Mary's response is filled with joy and awe and gratitude to God's work in her life, so much so that her worship of God actually opened her heart up to seeing that she was right in the middle, right in the middle of the greatest revolution to ever take place. The revolution taking place in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And friends, this is 
a revolution of love. You see, God was doing something new in and through Mary, and God's power and love was breaking into the world through the birth of Jesus. And because of Jesus, nothing will ever be the same in your life. Because friends, love changes everything. The power of God's love is the power that changes all things. It is not, and it will never be, the power of hate or the power of fear or the power of judgment or condemnation. It will only be the power of God's unconditional love and grace that transforms your heart and all of creation. And friends, this is where I think we get it wrong so much of the time in our misguided thinking. You see, somehow, somehow we come to believe that we have all of the answers and that our answers are the right answers. We misunderstand our place in the order of God's mission and vision for God's creation. Friends, our role, our role in God's mission for creation is to love God with all of our heart and our soul and our strength and our might and to love our neighbor, can I hear it? As ourself. Our role is nothing more and nothing less. So the story of the Annunciation and the birth of Jesus reveals this precious, precious gift that God is giving to us. In giving us life through Jesus, God is also revealing to us what love looks like. That love is is more than an emotion. It is more than a feeling. It is more than your favorite food or a great movie that you saw last week. Friends, God's love is action. It's action. It's the action of coming down to earth as a lowly infant and ultimately revealing God's heart to us. You see, God's love is this force It's a force that has the power to change the world. You see, love in the gift of Jesus is the kingdom of God doing nothing short of breaking into the world in this time and place in history. And as we, as we share this gift, as we share the good news of Jesus Christ, God's love is revealed to the world and God's power is revealed when we give witness, when we talk about when we share the ways that God has made the impossible possible. How many of you have faced a challenging situation this week? Anyone? Did you see God move in that? Did you see God create possibility? I challenge you this week to share that story and invite someone to come to church, one of our four services on Christmas Eve. Mary embraced the how of Almighty God through a life of worship. And Mary's life of worship often happened when she was with other people, in community, so to speak, 
Now, Mary magnified the Lord in awe and joy with Elizabeth. And in that moment, they formed this small but mighty community, worshiping and praising God. And ultimately, Mary's worshipful response to God's work in her life has become known as some of the most powerful words in history. And these words help us understand the difference between being an MVP and MVP in the kingdom of God. You see, as powerful and prophetic as the Magnificat is, it becomes absolutely meaningless if it doesn't move us to respond. Response, my friends, is this critical component of our faith. And this is where the how becomes critical, too. It is the how that moves us from apathy to being a force of love in the world. But it comes down to our hearts. Our hearts have to grow, to become strangely warmed, as John Wesley would put it, so that we reflect God's love and grace in the world. And we do this by opening our hearts through worship and gratitude. And when we do this, we are making room for God's story to be written on our hearts. That is so beautiful and life-changing. And this brings us back to the story of the Grinch and the Who's of Whoville. So how did the Who's respond? Well, the Who's responded with worship as they woke up that Christmas morning and found that all things had been stolen from them. Instead of being mad or angry or sad, they reached out for one another. The Who's didn't settle for a minimally viable response. Instead, they became the MVPs of the story as they acknowledged their hurt and their disappointment, and then they gathered together as a community, joyfully singing and ultimately welcoming the Grinch. The Who's could have responded to everything being stolen from them by having their hearts grow smaller and tighter, they had every single right to respond that way, but they chose a different path. They chose to worship and to worship together in community. And in this, they reminded each other that the day wasn't about presents or lights or the rare roast beef feast. It was about worshiping God and giving thanks for one another. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. At the end of the day, when we are reflecting on how our day was, the question becomes not, how is your day, dear? But who do you want to be? Do you want to be someone who responds with a minimally viable response? Or do you want to be an MVP, the most valuable player in the greatest story there ever was? responding how Jesus would respond with love and action that is grounded in the power of God to make the impossible possible. Amen.